Welcome to the lecture series on vitamins and nutrition. So, as a continuation from the previous session, uh, today we are going to look at individual vitamins in detail. So, starting from fat soluble vitamins, we will proceed one by one and I uh, will take you through uh, different aspects of these vitamins. So, today's session we are going to talk in detail about vitamin A. So, if you look at this particular vitamin, it is a very interesting vitamin and but before we go on with vitamin A, I thought it will be better if we can look at the various aspects of all fat soluble or lipid soluble vitamins at a go. So, we would be uh, able to understand what are the common features that you find with these fat soluble vitamins or as we say lipid soluble vitamins. First feature would be they all are hydrophobic in nature. So, what do you mean by being hydrophobic? So, they are all fat soluble most of them if you look at their structure as a benzene ring and this makes them have or imbibe hydrophobic nature and especially for uh, these lipid soluble vitamins you also find many of them they have isoprene units. You might be interested. So, what is this isoprene unit has to do with fat soluble vitamins? See these isoprene units are a residual side chain you find as a means of long chain fatty acids. Most of the long chain fatty acids if they are saturated may have isoprene kind of uh, side structure within them and moreover if you look at the isoprene uh, feature as a structural feature, you find this among most of the essential oils in the plants and even the rubber latex as we say the very word or the very uh, foundation of this particular uh, side chain pattern was originally reported in latex related compounds. So, isoprene unit is only the structural side chain you find this attached to the main uh, hydrophobic structure. And the third feature if you look at them they cannot be synthesized by our body. So, it means what we are dependent on dietary sources. So, that is one of the major limiting steps. So, if a person would run short of this these category of vitamins eventually they would end up completely depleting all the resources in their body and would end up showing deficiency diseases. So, we need a constant supply from dietary sources. Second thing their absorption uh, is one of the fundamental aspects and as you see over there this particular point we have seen many times and I am trying to bring this over there bringing to your memory so that you would be able to understand being a lipid soluble vitamin you would be able to associate this with the absorption of fat. So, wherever we have a diet rich in fat or lipids you would always expect these lipid soluble vitamins could go very well along with them. Then you have what we call it as the means by which it is transported across. So, you do have lipoproteins and specific binding proteins. This is very very uh, important to understand because being lipid soluble their access to cells could be a problem. So, these carrier proteins as we call them lipoprotein or specific binding proteins are unique for individual category of vitamins and these proteins play an essential role in making these fat soluble vitamins available to individual cells in the site of action. Now, you consider whenever we take a diet rich in vitamins these lipid soluble vitamins you find all this excess of vitamins are being stored in essential organs and primarily this organ being liver and adipose tissue. So, liver being a principal organ not only in derivatizing these vitamins it means acting upon them and breaking them down and eliminating them, but it is an excellent source for storage. So, that is one of the reasons when a person for some reason or the other has been having a diet less of these lipid soluble vitamins you still find them survive for a longer period of time without showing symptoms of deficiency and this particular feature is special for liver and adipose tissues 
and being fat soluble they are stored comfortably over there. So, you can have a clue suppose if a person is suffering from liver diseases let us say the person is a chronic alcoholic you do have a problem the liver storage ability would be affected and this will directly reflect on how much amount of vitamins are available in storage. Okay. So, now the last point as you look over here uh, this is an important point because as we are talking about deficiency we should also be aware of what will happen if a person ends up taking more amount of vitamins what is required. Maybe for a transient period of time it is ok and as long as we have sufficient storage organs like liver and adipose tissue it would be stored there, but suppose even the storage organs uh, are being really full then that leads to accumulation and eventually that can lead to toxicity. This being a very critical thing and we need a special attention and in fact it could be treated as a disease in itself. Now we are going to look at vitamin E. So, so far whatever I have explained all these points are common points and you can take it this as a introduction to lipid soluble vitamins. So, these features present a common uh, I would say categorization or uh, a property for all lipid or fat soluble vitamins. So, we are going to look at vitamin A and uh, as you look here vitamin A comes under one of the key components of lipid soluble vitamin. It is one of the vitamins A, D, E, K all these are fat soluble vitamins and the alphabetical order of A, B, C or whatever we say it is basically as a very close association with the chronology of discovery or into research investigation. So, a very serious research on vitamins basically started only uh, at the beginning of 19th century. So, when you say beginning of 19th century to 20th century was a time period where people were systematically associating vitamin discovery with diseases and were able to eventually report their structures. So, I would say to be very precise the scientific or the biochemical study of vitamins especially fat soluble vitamins uh, started only from 20th century beginning. So, as you look over here vitamin A is an essential nutrient and it is needed in very small quantity and the moment you talk about vitamin A immediately you associate this with visual system. Suppose if you see now your ability to adapt to light your ability to look into the details of the eye everything you have to associate with vitamin A and that is why deficiency in vitamin A can lead to blindness and this blindness if not reversed within a short period of time with sufficient dietary supplements can eventually lead to irreversible blindness that is why it is a very important vitamin. Normally we do not deplete the sources, so it means what if a person is showing vitamin A deficiency the person already the person's system would have already showed lot of symptoms and the people will not be able to really understand the background of these deficiency diseases until really intended to look for. So, eventually what happens these people start showing symptoms and by the time you start treating the symptoms you end up uh, in a very severe depleted case. So, that is one thing the second thing what we call it like epithelial integrity as you see over here. So, what do you mean by epithelial integrity it means epithelial tissues are one of the primary tissues among the four tissues in our body and they provide a protective layer throughout our body in all the internal organs. If you name a gland it will be lined with epithelial tissues and these epithelial tissues are further I would say differentiate themselves into glandular cells. So, most of the organelles I would say most of the hormone producing organs I would say the endocrine organs will have follicular epithelium and most of the protective mucosal layers will have modified epithelial cells responsible for the secretion. So, you see over here vitamin A deficiency directly affects the integrity of epithelial tissues. So, epithelial tissues will undergo keratinization what do you mean by keratinization 
you look over there the surface of your skin ok. So, you see there lots of uh, the dead cells which form the top layer of the skin. So, this is a protective mechanism and if you could see the top layer of dead cells basically the waterproof keratin layer seen over there it is acceptable. But suppose the internal organs the glandular structures if you find the epithelial cells which are supposed to nourish them and provide a mucosal layer is going to get depleted and it is going to get replaced with a tough keratin like layer that may not be good and eventually that can lead to cracking of these layers and could make people vulnerable to infections. And second thing all fast growing cells for example, the red RPCs, epithelial cells as I have said earlier, the glandular cells on the gastrointestinal tract, all the secretory cells which produce mucosa they all get affected. So, that is why they play a very critical role in the regeneration of cells and in the maintenance of cells and in the replacement of cells during growth. So, as we call it vitamin A deficiency is one of the major nutritional concerns in poor societies. Probably if you are coming from a developed society or even I would say developing countries we do not have any issue of vitamin A deficiency seen uh, as a profound condition because most of the dietary supplements you find over there. But some segments of developing countries and completely underdeveloped countries drastically lack the provision of storing vitamin A in their system and this leads to major health hazards. In fact, it has driven the food technology and the genetic engineering and genetically modified technologies to intervene and make vitamin A rich foods. So, what we call it like the golden rice is basically vitamin A rich. In other words, the carotenoid derivatives, carotene producing uh, components are incorporated as part of the genetically engineered plan. So, that this particular rice would appear yellowish or dark yellowish in color something resembling kind of a gold appearance you call them as like golden rice. So, for those people children who really have a constant struggle in getting sufficient vitamin A taking a supplement of golden rice would be a real real good thing for them to have a supplementary condition where getting a routine dose of vitamin A through normal food would be a, uh, a good alternative. So, you see over here we have a source of vitamin A from both animal and as well as plant sources. So, if you say animal sources the moment you talk of vitamin A think of colored pigments orange, red colored, yellowish orange colored any of these pigments would be a precursor from the plant or an animal source could be the direct precursor for vitamin A. So, think of all those fruits papaya, carrot and all those uh, fruits like beetroot ok. Do not confuse them with anthocyanins although they also come under the colored products the food coloring substances from natural sources. For animal sources if you consider you could consider liver as an excellent source and you could consider egg yolk as an excellent source ok. All those meat and food products and fruits and vegetables which are colored in nature especially I would say yellowish orange or reddish brown color could be a source for vitamin A. So, mangoes they are rich in vitamin A. So, all those colored preparations. So, you might be like really surprised if so much of abundant source is there how could ever a pe person could go in depletion of vitamin A, but that definitely happens in low income countries and underdeveloped societies. Even for us if you are not very particular in taking sufficient amount of diet rich in these pigment source of carotenoid rich food we also could end up in deficiency diseases. So, you look over here what are different kinds of vitamin available. So, so far I have mentioned the dietary sources the natural source of vitamin A and you look here the natural source of vitamin A being an excellent source, but 
Having known the structure of vitamin A, people have also come up with synthetic sources of vitamin A. So, these synthetic sources of vitamin A has been a tremendous source for making so many pharmaceutical preparations and formulations where they could be incorporated and made available to treat deficiency conditions. So, if you look at it, once the vitamin A goes inside a body, it gets converted or it gets metabolized or it undergoes certain metabolic changes and it becomes very active and you find them in three different derivative forms. The retinol form which is the vitamin A form, then retinal which you call it like retinal dehyde, then you have the other form what we call it like retinoic acids. So, you could refresh yourself on the basic chemistry of alcohols. The basic chemistry of alcohol you look at over there, the OH group being oxidized you end up with the aldehyde and this is again oxidized further you end up with retinoic acids. Okay, so, the animal tissues you normally find the retinol being an alcohol closely forming an ester with long chain fatty acids. So, that is why you find in the animal tissues retinol is stored as retinyl ester. So, more of those structures over here. So, you see over there here you find so carotenoid is basically a kind of a dwell molecule you have around 40 carbon atoms and the retinol is basically half of it. Can you see there in the middle of it there you have the chain is being broken down and you have the retinol derivative over here. So, this part of the structure is what I was calling as the isoprene units. Okay. Here you have the organic molecule the I would say the benzene ring okay, and the benzene ring which is basically the beta ionone derivative and then to this you have the isoprene units attached and in case with carotenoid you have three varieties of carotenoid the alpha, beta and the gamma carotenoids. So, we look over here the precursor compounds of vitamin A carotenoids which are fundamentally called the beta carotenoids because you do have alpha, beta and gamma carotenoids they are I would say very closely resembling structures, but the one which has a very good provision of getting converted into vitamin A the beta carotenoids come under that category. Okay. It is not that alpha, beta, gamma are all closely related and they could be interconverted it is true they could be interconverted, but beta carotene forms a direct precursor for making vitamin A. So, you see there beta ionone rings and a polyprenoid chain. So, this polyprenoid chain is what we call it as the isoprene units. So, look at this structure over here you have the beta ionone ring. So, here you have a beta ionone ring and here you have a beta ionone ring. So, as it is being presented here both appear to be inverted. So, this immediately should give you a clue it is basically the transform the transform and the cis form. So, the transform is supposed to be an inactive form whereas, the cis form is supposed to be an active form, but you see there in liver the carotenoid is metabolized or cleaved to give you retinol. Okay. So, this retinol is half of it and this retinol can be I would say added with the phosphoric acid could be phosphorylated and can be converted into I would say uh, aldehyde molecule retinal and can be oxidized further to give you retinoic acid. Okay. So, all these are carbon compounds that are related with each other the structure here which resembles the classical retinal and the active form what we call it like the cis form is interconvertible from the transform and the cis form. So, cis form transform are being mutually converted. So, the cis form is the active form and the vitamin when it undergoes I would say metabolic change when it is being used up gets converted into the transform 
and transform goes into circulation and to the liver where it is metabolized and again back converted to cis form and this happens like a cycle. So, we are going to look at it shortly you find this retinol, retinal, retinoic acid are all oxidative products. You do have I would say enzymes which help in mutual oxidation and reduction process. So, you have this retinol reductases and oxidases doing the job of mutual oxidation and reduction. Now, we are going to look at uh, the feature of absorption. As I have been telling you earlier the retinyl esters are being broken down and being an ester you know very well you studied in your lower classes whenever an ester is broken down you do have a corresponding alcohol and a free acid. Now, the corresponding alcohol the organic alcohol is basically the retinol the organic alcohol the retinol and the fatty acid component has to get across the intestine require bile. So, bile is basically the natural emulsifying substance. So, this bile will ensure that the particles are being broken down into tiny particles and they could be effectively digested by enzymes in this case lipase category of enzymes and are being incorporated into micelles and then these micelles get absorbed and goes across the intestine. So, you see over here 90 percent of the retinoids can be absorbed. So, what do you mean by retinoids? When we use the word retinoids we mean to say all three categories retinol, retinal and retinoic acid all three category of compounds are called retinoids. So, you see that carotenoid which is the plant source it is observed intact absorption rate is much lower although it is observed intact intestinal scales can convert carotenoids to retinoids. So, I want you to look at this structure. So, this is the carotenoid the lengthy one although plants have ability to process this and some of the animals until it is broken down to retinol it is not of much use for human dietary supplements. So, once it is been broken down we have the retinol and other derivatives coming up which has lots of physiological applications. So, you look over here their absorption is approximately 80 percent the carotenoid absorption ok and then it is passed through the lymphatic system into the blood stream. If you recollect in the previous sessions that day we were talking about lacteals involved in the absorption of fat and as we know logically fat soluble vitamins are absorbed along with lipids. So, it is much it makes good sense associating their absorption into the lymphatic system of or through the lacteals. So, absorption is poor in case of diarrhea yeah obviously and if at all a person is suffering from any absorption related conditions like Crohn's disease and so on or autoimmune sicknesses leave alone even a normal infectious diarrhea can have an impact on the amount of fat that can go across ok. So, especially in diarrhea jaundice and abdominal I would say problems connected with infectious diseases or irritable bowel disease or whatever any chronic problem in absorption would have a direct impact on the absorption of vitamins. So, you see over here if you are going to increase the amount of fat being absorbed you could also proportionately increase the amount of absorption of vitamins especially vitamin A the fat soluble vitamin. Vitamin A which is not absorbed is excreted within one or two days in the feces. So, what happens sometimes we end up taking too much of vitamin A and vitamin A needs an ambient lipid rich environment to get across if that particular stuff is not available as part of the diet. So, the vitamin A would simply be eliminated in the feces I mean it is lost. So, that is a problem if a person is going to take supplementary tablets vitamin pills vitamin A tablets for a longer period of time than not required would end up 
excreting all the excess vitamins being given and it is eliminated from the body. So, when we look at the transport this is very interesting because we need to know the bioavailability profile. So, to understand the bioavailability profile of vitamin A we also need to understand how they are transported across. So, you see that they are transported via chylomicrons from intestinal cells to the liver. So, if you could recollect how they are being transported, they are being transported as tiny particles, micro sized particles. So, chylo refers to the tiny white colored particles which are doped with lipid rich substances. In this case, it should be vitamin A completely covered with lipid rich components and is transported across. So, you see there, there is one carrier protein what we call it as the retinol binding protein. So, retinol binding protein is a very important protein and this protein provides the transport service for vitamin A. So, vitamin A retinol the technical name being actually binds with retinol binding protein and this together with retinol binding protein finds its way into circulation and this in the circulation it could be effectively transported to any part where vitamin A is needed. In our case primarily vitamin A is constantly needed by your ocular systems or for the eye for the vision. So, you see over there from intestine to liver transportation occurs through retinol binding protein. Yeah, there are lot of lots of outshoot studies that people conduct trying to evaluate retinol binding protein deficiency with vitamin A. You can even ask a question if a person is going to have a problem with retinol binding protein levels would the person suffer from vitamin A deficiency although in the diet they are taking sufficient amount of vitamin A. Yeah, it is possible. So, that is why we say the carrier proteins could be a rate limiting step in certain cases where this particular retinol binding protein is simply not available to the level required for transportation or we could also take it the other way around you have too much of this vitamin A components available beyond the ribosome I would say the retinol binding protein could really possess and carry it over. So, you see there from intestine to liver and then you have the chylomicrons in circulation. Chylomicrons are basically the transportable forms in circulation. Then from there from the liver it goes to other organs. So, liver you could imagine it to be such a metabolically active organ allows vitamin A to be stored and also gives the way through which vitamin A could be transferred across to other tissues. So, liver acts like a kind of an hub through which the vitamin A could be transferred to different parts of the tissues. So, you see over here retinol binding protein to the cell membrane and cellular retinoic acid binding protein. So, this is also interesting you see over here the cellular retinoic acid binding protein. So, there is a difference in retinol you have a hydroxy group and in the retinoic acid you have a carboxylic group. So, this CRPP is basically a retinoic acid binding protein and from there it could go and can have an impact on gene expression. So, it is a kind of a series of networks that you could understand that right from the point of absorption to the point where it goes to the actual tissue there are so many intermediate steps which are elaborately dealt in terms of the physiology how this particular vitamin is going to take care especially the biochemical aspect of it. So, you see over there it is a summary it is a picture summary of what I have discussed. So, you see there the retinol ester the retinol ester is basically what you find over here being absorbed in the intestines and being broken down in the brush border intestines goes to liver and from the liver it is being transported to the target cells 
being bound with retinol binding protein. So, you see over there retinol ester getting converted to retinol then being oxidized further as retinoic acid and becomes chylomicron and then you do have free retinol binding protein being regenerated to help in the transportation of vitamin A. So, this is a quick summary of what is happening which I have dealt earlier in the previous slides. You can see how the target cells are being taken care to provide sufficient amount of vitamin A to the site of action. So, you see over there whenever we are looking at vitamin A absorption you have a part partnering vitamin vitamin E. So, vitamin E acts like a kind of an antioxidant although vitamin A's precursor the beta carotene in itself is an antioxidant. So, retinol is basically I would say goes into this phase. So, the retinol is considered as a steroid hormone okay, and the retinol which participates in the visual cycle. So, retinol is very essential it is not a steroid hormone in structure, but actually is responsible in synthesizing steroidal hormones and then you have again retinoic acid playing an excellent role in synthesizing steroidal hormones. So, you see over there how or where these compounds can be utilized in the body the scope is enormous. So, look over here as I have been telling you in the liver it is stored as retinol palmitate. So, what is this palmitate? So, palmitate is a long chain fatty acid. So, I would like to conclude this session I uh, will summarize till the point of fixed storage. So, today we saw uh, overview of lipid soluble vitamins then we saw vitamin A's overall profile what would be the general function of vitamin A and we were also looking into the features of absorption of vitamin A and then we looked at different aspects in which vitamin A is transported to different parts of the body. So, to conclude for today's session I would summarize we saw a grand intro to lipid soluble vitamin profile then we talked about vitamin A the chemical structure of vitamin A the precursors we also spoke on uh, different aspects in which vitamin A could be taken from dietary sources and where it gets absorbed and how it is transported and finally, in the aspects of how vitamin A is transferred from different parts of the body through liver as a storage organ. So, thank you once again for being attentive in this session.